welcome to Hikate's Crossing as we continue our exploration of the 10th insight. Now we're going to use the Shaman's Oracle today. Let's see what card we're going to reflect on. Let's have a look. Okay, the card that we're going to look at today is the Hunter of Paths. So let's have a look at the Hunter of Paths. Hunter of Paths. I am the hunter of paths. I track the way through the complexities of life, seeking pathways for those who call on me. I lead you by the best way I can find, avoiding dangers and wrong turnings, seeking out the quickest route or the longest, whichever will benefit you most. I help you in times of uncertainty and when you feel lost or abandoned, whatever the circumstances of your journey with me at your side, I can help you find the best way forward. So the hunter of the past, however and when, wherever we live, we need pathways to follow. This is as true today as it was for our ancestors. We seek our past to show us how best to achieve our goals or find the right course of action amid a maze of turnings and decisions. The hunter of paths is depicted here leaping onto the back of a creature whose long neck gives a clear view in every direction. With this hunter by our side, we too can enjoy that clarity of vision, and with it carefully choose which path to follow. The hunter's presence is a positive indicator that our instincts will guide us towards fruitful ways forward. Interpretations. Finding the way. Looking for ways to reach your goals. Progressing wisely. Being mindful of wrong turnings. Discovering shortcuts. Making decisions. And discernment. What an interesting card for today. Okay, so let's have a look at the 10th insight. Remove that. that there. Right, 10th insight. So we're in the middle of a chapter here. It was the last time we finished. So I'm not quite sure where we are. So let's have a look. In Inner Hell, we are up to, okay, in Inner Hell, let's have a look. Let's continue this. The, let's, let's start with this. The idea seemed prosperous to me. Why would anyone want to be born into a place like that? Because they were sure they had enough strength to break out, to end the cycle, to heal the family system in which they would be born. They were confident they could awaken and work through the resentment and anger at finding themselves in, this, in these deprived circumstances and see it all as a preparation for a mission, usually one of helping others out of similar situations, even if they are violent. We have to see them as having the potential to break free of the drama. Then the liberal perspective on crime and violence, the idea that everyone can change and be rehabilitated, is a desirable one. The conservative approach is without merit. Will smiled. Not exactly. The liberals are right to see that people have, who have grown up in abusive and oppressive situations are a product of their environment, and the conservatives are out of touch to the extent they believe stopping a life of crime or public dole is just a matter of making a conscious choice. But the liberal approach is superficial as well to the degree they believe people can change if offered different circumstances, better financial support or education for instance. Usually intervention programs focus only on helping others to better their decision making and economic choices. In the case of violent offenders, rehabilitation attempts have always offered at best superficial counselling and in the worst cases excuses and leniency which is precisely the wrong thing to do. Every time someone with a disturbed control drama is slapped on the hand, turned loose with no consequences, it enables the behaviour to continue and reinforces the idea that this behaviour is not serious, which just sets up the circumstances that guarantee it will occur again. Then what can be done, I asked. Will seem to be vibrating with excitement. We can learn to intervene spiritually, and that means helping to bring the whole process into consciousness, as these souls here are doing for these those caught in the illusions. Will was staring at the souls in the ring, then looked at me and shook his head. I can get all the information I've just relayed to you from these souls, but I still can't see the world vision clearly. We haven't learned how to build enough energy yet. I focused on the souls in the ring but could get no information other than what Will had conveyed. 
Clearly the soul groups held a greater knowledge and were projecting this knowledge toward the fear constructions. But like Will, I just still couldn't quite understand anything more. At least we have another piece of the tenth insight, Will said. We know that no matter how undesirable the behaviour of others is, we have to grasp that they are just souls attempting to wake up like us. I was suddenly jolted backward by a blast of dissonant noise, images of whirling colours seizing my mind. Will lunged forward and caught me at the last moment, pulling me into his energy and again holding me back firmly. For a moment I seemed to shake violently and then the discord passed. They've started the experiment again, Will said. I shook all off the dizziness and looked at him. That means Curtis will probably try to use force to stop them. He convinced that's the only way. As soon as I spoke those words, I saw a clear picture of Fae Man in my mind. The man David Lone Eagle thought had something to do with the experiment. He was somewhere overlooking the valley, glancing at Will. I realised that he had seen the same image. He nodded in agreement and we instantly began to move. When we stopped, Will and I were facing each other. Around us was more grey. Another loud, disharmonious sound shattered the silence and Will's face began to lose focus. He continued to hold on to me, and after several moments, the sound ended. These sound bursts are coming more frequently now, Will said. We may not have much time left. I nodded, fighting the dizziness. Let's look around, Will said. As soon as we focused on our surroundings, we saw what appeared to be a massive energy, several hundred yards away. Immediately, it closed to within 40 or 50 feet. Be careful, Will cautioned. Don't identify completely with them. Just listen and find out who they are. I focused warily and immediately saw souls in motion and an image of the town from which I had escaped. I recoiled in fear, which actually made them come closer to us. Stay centred in love, Will instructed. They can't pull us in unless we act as though we want them to sa we want them to save us. Try to send them love and energy. It will either help them or make them run away. Realising the souls were more afraid than I was, I found my centre and beamed them love energy. Immediately they moved rapidly away from us to the original position. Why can't they accept the love and wake up, I asked Will. Because when they feel the energy and it raises their consciousness a degree, their preoccupation lifts somewhat and doesn't fend off the anxiety of their aloneness. Coming into awareness and breaking free of a control drama always feels anxious at first because the compulsion has to lift before the inward solution to the lostness can be found. That's why a dark night of the soul sometimes precedes increased awareness and spiritual euphoria. A movement to the right caught our attention. When I focused, I realized that other souls were in the area. They came closer and the others moved away. I strained to pick up on what the group was doing. Why do you think this group is here? I asked Will. He shrugged. They have something to do with this guy, Feynman. In the space around the group, I began to see a moving image, a sense of some kind. When I brought it clearly into focus, I realized it was the image of an expansive, expansive industrial plant somewhere on Earth, with large metal buildings and rows of what looked like transformers and pipes and miles of interleaking wire. At the center of the complex, atop one of the largest buildings, was a command center of pure glass. Inside, I could see rows of computers and gauges of all descriptions, I glanced at Will. I see it, he said. As we continued to survey the complex, our perspective expanded so that we could now view the plant from above. From here, we could see miles of wire leaving the plant in all directions, feeding huge towers containing some sort of laser beams, shooting energy out to other local stations. Do you know where all this is, I asked Will. He nodded. It's centralized energy generating plant. Movement at one end of the complex attracted our attention. Emergency vans and fire trucks were arriving at one of the larger buildings. An ominous glow radiated from the third floor windows. At one point the glow brightened and then the ground under the entire building seemed to crack. In the explosion of dust and debris, the building shuddered and slowly collapsed. To the right, another building burst into flames. The scene moved to the command centre, where inside technicians moved frantically. From the right, a door opened and a man entered with an armful of charts and blueprints. He laid them out on a table and worked with what appeared to be determined confidence. Walking with a limp to one side of the room, he began to adjust switches and dials. Gradually, the ground stopped shaking and the fires were brought under control. 
He continued to work hastily and to instruct the other technicians. I looked at the individual now and charged more closely, and then turned to Will. That's Feynman. Before Will could, res could respond, the scene shifted into fast forward. Before our eyes, the plant was saved. Then quickly, workers began to dismantle it building by building. At the same time, on a site nearby, a new, smaller facility was being constructed that would manufacture more compact generators. Finally, most of the complex had been returned to its natural wooded state, and the new facility was turning out small units that we could see behind each house and business throughout the countryside. Abruptly, our perspective backed away until we could see a single individual in the foreground watching the same scene we were. When we could see his profile, I realised that it was Feynman. Before his current birth, contemplating what he would achieve in life, Will and I looked at each other. This is part of his birth vision, isn't it? I asked. Will nodded. This must be his soul group. Let's see how much more we can find out about him. We both focused on the group, and another image formed in front of us. It was the 19th century war camp, the headquarters tent again. We could see Feynman together with the con commander, the man I had seen again in the illusion town. Feynman was on the other side was the other aide who had been there with Williams. He was the one who limped. As we watched their interaction, we began to pick up on the story of their association. A bright tactician, Feynman was in charge of strategy and technological developments. In advance of the attack, the commander had ordered smallpox-laden blankets, covertly traded to the Native Americans. Attacked Feynman adamantly opposed not so much because of its effect on the indigenous people as because he felt that it was politically indefensible. Afterwards, even as the success of the battle was being hailed in Washington, the press found out about the use of smallpox and an investigation was launched. The commander and his cronies in Washington set Feynman up as a scapegoat and his career was ruined. Later, the commander set forth on a glorious political career and national state stature before he was all treacherously double-crossed by the same Washington insiders. Feynman, for his part, never recovered. His own political ambitions had been totally destroyed. Over the years, he became increasingly more embittered and resentful, trying desperately to marshal public opinion to challenge his commander's account of the battle. For a while, several journalists pursued the story, but soon public interest faded completely, and Feynman remained in a state of disgrace. Later, towards the end of his life, he languished in the realisation that his political goals would never be reached, and blaming his old commander for his humiliation, he attempted to assassinate the ex-politician at a state dinner and was shot dead by bodyguards. Because Feynman had cut himself off from his inner security and love, he could not fully awaken after death. For years, he believed he had escaped his ill-fated attempt to kill his old commander and had lived in illusion no constructions, holding on to his hate and doomed to the repeated horror of planning and attempting another assassination, only to be shot over and over. As I watched, I realised that Feynman could have been trapped in the illusions for a much longer period of time had it not been for the determined efforts of another man who had been at the military encampment with Feynman. I could see an image of his face and I recognised his expression. That's Joel again, the journalist I met, I said to Will, without losing my focus on the image. Will nodded in response. After death, Joel had become a member of the Alta Soul Ring and become totally dedicated to waking up Feynman. His intention to, during the lifetime with Feynman had been to expose any cruelty or treachery on the part of the military towards the Native Americans, but even though he had known about smallpox contamination, he had been persuaded to keep quiet by a combination of bribes and threats. After death, he'd been devastated by his life review, but had remained conscious and had vowed to help Feynman, who he felt had been ruined because of his failure to intervene. After a long period of time, Feynman finally responded and underwent a long and painful life review himself. He had originally intended in the 19th century life to become a civil engineer involved in the peaceful development of technology, but he had been beguiled by the prospect of becoming a war hero like the commander, and of developing new war strategies and devices. In the years between lives, he had been involved in helping others on Earth with the proper use of technology. When he slowly began to receive a vision of another life approaching, slowly at first and then with great conviction, he realised that soon mass energy devices would be discovered, 
that had been the potential of liberating humankind, but these devices would be extremely dangerous. As he felt himself being born, he knew that he would come to work with this technology, and he was well aware that in order to succeed, he would have to again face his tendency to crave power and recognition and status. Yet he saw that he would have to help there would be six other people. He visualized the valley working together somewhere in the dark, the falls in the background, utilizing a process to bring in the world vision. As he began to fade from view, I could make out aspects of the process he was seeing. First, a group of seven would begin to remember past experiences with each other and to work through the residual feelings. Then the group would consciously amplify its energy using the eighth insight techniques and each would express his or her particular birth vision. And finally, the vibration would accelerate, unifying the soul groups of the seven individuals. Out of the knowledge gained, there would, there would come the full memory of our intended future, the world vision, the view of where we're going and what we have to do to reach our destiny. Suddenly, the whole scene disappeared along with Feynman's group. Will and I were left there alone. Will's eyes were animated. Do you see what was happening, he asked. This means that Feynman's original intention was actually to perfect and decentralize the technology he's working on. If he realizes this fact, he will stop the experiment. We've got to find him, I said. No, Will replied, pausing to think. That won't help. Not yet. We've got to find the rest of the, this group of seven. It must take the pulled energy of a group to bring in the memory of the world vision, a group that can work through the process of remembering and re energize themselves. I don't understand this part about clearing residual feelings. Will moved closer. Remember the other mental images you've been having, the memories of other places, other times? Yes. The group that is forming to deal with this experiment has been together before. There will be residual feelings that must be worked through. Everyone will have to deal with them. Will looked away for a moment, then said, this is more of the tenth insight. Not just one group is coming in. There are many others. We'll all have to learn to clear these resentments. As he spoke, I thought about the many group situations I'd experienced, where some members of the group liked each other immediately, while others seemed to fall into instant discord for no apparent reason. I wondered, was human culture now ready to perceive the distant source of these unconscious reactions? Then, without warning, another shrill sound reverberated through my body. Will grabbed me and pulled me closer, our faces almost touching. If you fall again, I don't know if you can get back while the experiment is operating at this level, he shouted. You'll have to find the others. A second blast ripped us apart and I felt myself release into the familiar swirling colours, knowing that I was heading back as before into the earth dimension. Yet this time, instead of tumbling quickly into the physical, I seemed to linger momentarily Something was pulling at my solar plexus, moving me laterally. As I strained to focus, the surging environment calmed, and I began to sense the presence of another person, without actually seeing the individual's form. I could almost remember the character of the feeling, who makes me feel this way. At last I began to discern a blurry figure, thirty or forty feet away, which moved closer gradually until I recognised who it was. Charlene! As she closed to within ten feet, I sensed a shift in my body, as though I was suddenly relaxing more completely simultaneously. I noticed a pinkish-red energy field that encircled Charlene. Seconds later, to my amazement, I noticed an identical field around myself. When we were about five feet from each other, the relaxation in my body grew into an increased sensualness, and finally into a wave of orgasmic love. I suddenly couldn't think, what was happening? Just as our fields were about to touch, the shrill dissonance returned, and I was jolted backward again, twisting out of control. Hey, that's it for today. Don't forget to check the links down below. Check the links on my channel. Like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you know when the next video will be uploaded. Take care. Blessed be.